Welcome to the Sound on Sound recording and mixing channel podcast. I'm here with Nuno Fonseca of Sound Particles, and he's going to tell me how Sound Particles came about. Because from my perspective in the music industry, you just appeared from nowhere with these rather interesting 3D manipulation plugins. So essentially, it all started with a crazy idea like 15 years ago. I also love cinema, and at some point I realized that the most interesting visual effects that I was seeing on movies, all of them use particle systems. That is a technique where they create thousands of points to create fire and smoke and desert storms and fairy dust. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to do the same thing with sound and have thousands of small sounds around you that would create these epic soundscapes? But at the time, it was only an idea. And then in 2012, I had finished my PhD on a different topic. And since no one was using uh, particle systems for sound, so as a computer nerd that I am, because this face doesn't fool anyone, I decided to, okay, let's create my own software with particle systems and be able to generate like thousands of sounds around you. And that would be interesting for soundscapes. Um, And that was the beginning. Two years later, I went to LA to a conference, but before going to the conference, I decided to send five or six emails to some professionals saying, okay, I'm doing this. I think this could be particularly interesting for big productions with a lot of explosions, that epic scenes. And I'm going to be in town in two weeks, so if you want to know more, just let me know. And the first reply that I've got was from Skywalker, invited me to go to Skywalker Ranch, do a presentation there. Uh, And then within six months, I ended up doing presentations at Wonder Brother, Universal, Paramount, Sony, Fox, later Disney, Pixar, Blizzard, Netflix, Apple, and many other places. And pretty much that was the beginning of Sound Particles. And we, okay, start releasing Sound Particle software. That idea was to use this kind of computer graphics, visual effects kind of approach, but to to sound. Uh, And then we started mainly with television and cinema. Our software is using things like Game of Thrones, uh, Frozen 2, Star Wars, Dune, uh, in video game companies like Blizzard, Epic. And then at some point we said, no, no, now we want to start also playing with music and bring our technology to music. And we start releasing our plugins in that area. So the first things you brought into music were really spin-offs from what you were doing for the film industry, which is uh, positioning things in three-dimensional space. Yeah, essentially we had several blocks that we could reuse, like panning in 3D in pretty much any format from stereo to 5.1, Dolby Atmos, Ambisonics up to Six Order and all of those things. And essentially we said, okay, now we have these blocks, what kind of things can we do to to um, to use this also with music because for a long time we wanted to start to play things with 3D and with music and one of the the first plugins that we made specifically for music was Energy Panner, the idea of having a panner but controlled by the intensity of the sound uh, and actually it was an idea that I had as a one day I was uh, driving to the office after leaving the kids at school and I was listening to some music and I thought okay it would be nice if I, if the drum starts to move around when they have this the, the this beat and drums starting to move and I said okay why can we why not doing a, a panner that is controlled by the intensity of the sound so we we create energy panner and with uh, this idea of a panner that pretty much is almost like a compressor but instead of, of using that to control the gain uh, we use them to control the panning and then we decided okay why why can we do the same thing but instead of using intensity of sound why not use uh, the frequency content so we create brightness panner that is based either on the brightness or on the pitch of the note. So when you have, for instance, an arpeggio, you start having the notes moving around depending on the pitch. Um, And that was our initial plugins in the music domain. 
But then you came out with control from the position of a mobile phone, which seems to be going back to your film roots again. Yeah, we of course we are uh, we have a big passion for spatial uh, audio, um, and we want everything to do with spatial audio. And one of the things that we always f thought that was almost like a kind of handicap is that we were not satisfied with any kind of way to control 3D panning because okay, you can use knobs for stereo; they are perfect for stereo. When you start to working with surround knobs are a little more complicated, eventually joysticks, but if, if you want to actually work in 3D and do some crazy or complex movement using knobs or joysticks or touch screens or a mouse, any, any of those situations actually uh, uh, made us very happy. So they said, okay, how can we do this? And the idea, okay, why not use a phone and using the, the motion sensors of a phone to simply point on the direction you want to sound. If you want the sound coming from a particular direction, simply point the, the, the phone in that direction. So it's like a, a laser pointer that you can create interesting movements, or if you can go crazy and even use two smartphones, one in each end, one for left, another for right, and you start doing these strange choreographies, panning things uh, around. And yeah, even if you are using in stereo, uh, our, uh, the idea behind our plugins is always to do, okay, even if you're working with stereo, you still can use this a lot and uh, having uh, a lot of fun and interesting things in stereo, but if you're using surround or even using immersive, it's even better. And uh, for instance, I was just talking with Alan Meyerson uh, uh, a few, two weeks ago at NAM, uh, uh, and he was telling me that, okay, he uses space controller every single day because for positioning sound, it's much more interesting, it's much more fun, and it's much more creative than actually using knobs or touch screens. But of course, we have a biased opinion. <laughs> it is a very intuitive way of matching sound position to visuals. It's simply panning, it's in pointing, and you get the sound there. And if you want to do crazy things, or even if you simply want some movement, like uh, uh, having things like small movements just to bring more life to your mixes. Uh, I think it's it fires much more much more of the creativity than using simply knobs or joysticks. So b before we move on, I understand that you're also involved in a project with East West a while ago, which was something very different, the text to singing engine. How did that work? We started very long time ago, it was in 2001. Um, so East West had just released um, a, a sound library called Voices of the Apocalypse. It was on the time that Giga Studio appeared. It was the beginning of the uh, uh, samplers by software. And essentially it was a sample library with voices from choirs. You have all the vowels, all the consonants completely separated and pretty much allow the user to, okay, I'm going to use the vowel A and you play or e, 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 and pretty much allow you to use that. And, and at that time, once again, I always like this crazy idea and try to think outside the box. And I sent uh, them an email saying, okay, have you ever considered having a program where you could actually write the text that you want the, the choir to sing? Uh, and that was the beginning. So I started creating uh, this software. Uh, people would be able to write the text like hallelujah and all of the things that you want the choir to sing. And then essentially, when you play the MIDI note, you would fire the right samples to make sure that if, for instance, you write the word love, okay, and you start, okay, press a MIDI note and you get, okay, starts the L and then starts the O and then you stop the L and old the old and then on the release you would stop the O and start the, the V. Um, so that allowed you to actually uh, be able to write the text before and then as you play, you start to have the choir singing. It was a lot of fun, uh, especially because on the beginning, I find out that people were having a lot of fun uh, having a symphonic choir singing dirty words. Uh, but then the things evolved, and actually that became became word builder, with, which is today still used on East West products like Hollywood choirs and uh, many other uh, choir products from East West uh, that allow people to write the text and then. Uh, having the, the computer to singing that text depending on the MIDI notes that they are receiving.
It was certainly a very sophisticated thing to develop that long ago. Yeah, and it was interesting because we start adding new things like, for instance, an English to phonetics dictionary to allow people to write text in English and then the software automatically know how that word should be pronounced and we you also would be able to edit the, the all of these things like if you want a consonant to stay longer or be more stronger or more weaker uh, and and you are you were able to almost like have a piano roll, but with with the the, the several phonemes that you want to to tweak to make even uh, uh, have much more interesting. And it was uh, quite rewarding to to see that uh, project uh, being used by a lot of uh, composers around the world. So yeah, it's something quite interesting that then leaves, left me to my uh, PhD that was to take that even further with having the computer resynthesizing everything. So imagine I'm singing something to the computer and then the computer will extract all the, the melody, the dynamics, the text that I'm being sent and then simply re-sing that with a different, different uh, sound library. So it was a, a very interesting process project that I spent a few years before starting Sound Particles. The other new product you've got is um, Density, which again seems rather different from anything that uh, I believe you've done before. And of course there are lots of double tracking programs around and detuning tricks, but you seem to have gone further. Yeah, once again, the idea of people try to um, increase the number of instruments and the number of voices, it's not new. We can see that even chorus, it's pretty much uh, uh, the first take on that approach when you try to create multiple instruments based on the single instrument. What we have done was simply, okay, let's try to do something almost like chorus, but with a much more modern approach using uh, granular synthesis, also to be using 3D spatial uh, audio if you want to use immersive audio um, and using particles. So the idea of density is to simply generating several fragments based on the original audio input and by having this additional fragments with slightly pitch shifting versions of it, slightly delayed versions of it, to be able to create uh, more ensembles. And either if you have a, a solo voice instrument that you want to convert into ensemble, or if you already have an ensemble, you simply want to add much more, some additional layers uh, to it, it allows very interesting results because when you think, when you talk about special audio and especially now with Dolby Atmos for music and all of those things, I think that sometimes we are targeting it wrong uh, because we almost position this as a panning tool for mixers. And for me, uh, special audio for music should be creative tools. It should be things that the artists, the composers, the producers, the musicians work directly with special. It's not something that, okay, let's record an album, then in the end a mixer will add some 3D features to it. No, I think it's much more interesting if we start right from the start, right from the creatives to use uh, tools to explore this special audio. And that's the, the reason for us having all of our plugins like Energy Pen and a Space Controller and now with Density to have more ways to explore special audio uh, for music but in a creative way and by creatives, by artists, instead of simply look at it as a mixing tool for mixers later on during the final mix. format do you think is going to be the one that wins over the consumers because everyone's still listening or most people are still listening on stereo headphones does that mean that everything needs to be converted to binaural or is there something better from the practical point of view we know that most people will not be able to afford the 20 speakers for their living rooms yes a few very few may actually do that or yeah a few may have some interesting high quality sound bars but 
we need to face the fact that most people will continue to use headphones to listen to music, to listen to uh, their series on Netflix, on their iPad, or to play video games. So pretty much, I, I believe that the future, more and more people will continue to use headphones. In the past, uh, over the last years, headphones continue to grow in terms of uh, percentage of use. So I think that special audio must be done with headphones. Nonetheless, we still have a problem to, to fix because binaural sound is not yet on the where they should be. Nowadays, when you select if you want special audio or without special audio, pretty much we are selecting if you want some special and more special related features. But eventually, with some cost in terms of equalization and sound quality, uh, or if you want a better sound quality but in stereo but without uh, special audio. So I actually believe that we have probably one, two years to uh, fix uh, to resolve this binaural and be able to get high quality binaural sound. There's actually one of the things that we are also doing at Sound Particles. We are trying to create our own binaural technology because I confess that uh, I'm not fully satisfied with all the existing solutions out there. Even the personalized ones still uh, are not to the spot where they should be. So I think that we have pretty much two years to fix this. If we are not able to get a very good binaural solution within two years, probably this hype about special for music could eventually decrease and be like a temporary fashion. But I believe that if we are able to get these binaural things right, it's going to uh, be uh, definitely the future of uh, uh, music because you get this sense of 3D. And once again, sometimes people think that Special audio, it's to put guitars moving around you and behind you. Now, even if you are doing listening to classical music and everything is on the front and static, the simple fact that you add these re reverbs and these reflections to additional directions be besides left and right, it gives you a much more interesting experience. And it's for that that we are also working on to try to come up with some solution to make sure that people get a better solution for music with spatial audio. Well, certainly for my own music, I've been working in a combination of traditional stereo and binaural, where the binaural process parts are probably not the key parts, but they're the bits that make the mix interesting. And that way, the, the lack of precision in the way that people perceive it is probably less important because we still have this problem that everyone has a different physical set of ears and no one binaural solution will fit them all. Yeah, and even we are doing a lot of things from computational simulations of ears, almost like the same way that we use acoustic software to uh, see how it's going to be the acoustics of a, of a concert hall that is going to be built or something like that. We are trying to use the same approaches just to handle and say, OK, I have this scan 3D of this person. Uh, how is actually the HRTFs of that. But binaural, it's a very complicated problem. It's something like, it's almost like a chain that breaks by the weakest links. And actually, we need to fix several problems. We need to get the, the perfect HRTF. We need to be able to also manage the equalization from headphones and uh, eventually adding ad track. Uh, so there is a, several sub-problems that if even if you get one of them very good, very well handled, uh, it's going to break by the weakest link because if you have something that is not very good handled, the binaural itself is going to, to break the, the experience. So uh, yeah, I really think it's going to be the, the, the future. Currently, pretty much all audio companies are, uh, are working on it. It's pretty much the holy grail of the current times because everyone from Dolby to Apple, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, and many other companies, Genelec and others are trying to, to handle this, but is also very, very complex problem to fix because uh, you need to uh, mix computer vision to be able to personalize the ears of someone because people will not be able to go to any quick chambers to have them uh, their HRTF captured or they will not use 3D scanners, professional 3D scanners. So there is a lot of things that uh, needs to be done. And uh, from the engineering point of view, it's a very, very challenging and complex problem. Uh, probably the biggest problem that we I face on my uh, all these years working in the audio industry. But 
we also want to give it a try, want to try and see if we can come up with an interesting solution that can help anyone enjoying even more music. Yeah, it is a difficult one, especially things like head tracking, because if you're playing a computer game, then maybe head tracking is useful if you've got, especially if you have a very wide screen. But if you're listening to music walking to work and you're looking around at the traffic, maybe it would be disorientating having the music shifting around all the time. So it's it's something that might suit some situations better than others. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, although eventually the head tracking could actually even have the opposite effect of actually uh, instead of having everything mixed together because if I'm using binaural without air tracking if I move my head everything comes with me uh, and uh, if I use air track everything stays locked and I simply move my head like I would do on the on the studio so yeah it's even air tracking is one of the things that we are also trying uh, different things to see uh, how it's going to be the end result uh, of it with all of this uh, technology. But yeah, that's, it's interesting because it's like we are on the pioneering years of this special audio and there is so many things open up, so many uh, ways that we can use uh, special audio in a technical uh, way. Um, and even we are working on some projects that we are not, uh, we cannot announce it yet, but it's very interesting creative ways for musicians and artists to start using with special audio because, like I mentioned, for me it's about having creative tools. Uh, imagine, for instance, if stereo which were only limited to have a panner and no plugin support uh, stereo, everything was only in mono, it would be a much more dull uh, world that we would live nowadays. But the fact that every plugin supports stereo creates interesting things in stereo. Okay, let's try to do the, the same thing and bring more uh, special features into the audio software. So I know you can't tell me about all the things you're working on in the future, but are there any uh, directions that you're particularly interested in exploring? I mean, for example, I've been playing around with quite a lot of these granular effect plugins, granular delays, which are very, very interesting. But if you could use your 3D positioning to put the grains in different places and get a, a sort of cloud of effects that uh, surround you, that could be a, a very interesting thing to, to listen to. Yeah, we are working on several fronts. And one of them is we are now working for almost three years now on the third generation of sound particles. And until now, uh, sound particle software was pretty much a sound design um, software for these epic movies and epic sound fake, soundscapes and sound effects. But essentially what we are doing with Sound Particles 3 that we hope to, to release until the end of the year, uh, more or less, um, that is to actually turn Sound Particles into a, a, a digital audio workstation, which means that imagine doing having a digital audio workstation with all the things that you do in the uh, audio workstation, but actually doing all of that in 3D. So imagine uh, having MIDI tracks and virtual instruments and uh, plugins and audio editing, all of those things. But actually, instead of doing something like in a digital workstation when you simply mix sounds on top of sounds in buses, you say, okay, I have this bus, so let's put everything on top of each other and then use spanners. The idea is to, okay, let's put things in the 3D space and then instead of using Panels, because even if you are working only with stereo, um, when you are working with digital audio workstation, your stereo features is pretty much a panel that you control how much do you want to, to each place. Nonetheless, if you are actually recording something, your choices are much wider because you can use, okay, if you use a middle side or deck tree or ORTF or any other stereo recording technique, you get completely different kinds of stereo. So the idea would be able to come with some of those features into sound particle and to say, okay, let's create something. This is my music. I want to place the guitar one meter uh, slighter to the back. I want to bring that the piano uh, one meter closer and slightly to that side and then create something. And since the virtual, since the, the sound particles create have this idea of a virtual microphone that pretty much it's almost like a, a virtual camera. It makes the system agnostic, which means that I can create something and say, okay, if I want to export this in Ambisonics, I said, okay, it's an Ambisonics microphone and 
I have a, a Masonic render, but if someone asks me, but now I want a 7.1.2, no problem. We change the settings of the microphone and you get the exact same music now being played with the 7.1.2. So that's one of the things that we want to be able to, to explore and allow people to use sound particles and these potentially with granular synthesis and 3D environment, uh, but allowing people from music that until now pretty much only people from sound effects were actually using it for sound design, but now having people from music say, okay, what would be the sound of 100 flying violins or what would be the sound of 100 drummers uh, spread over a large area and capture everything in 7.1.2? So start creating uh, and thinking about new ways of exploring audio or eventually having something say, okay, I want playing some music, but I want each note to be a particle and floating instead of panning the entire instrument around. No, each note to be completely independent and be able to float notes around. Uh, so, or eventually using space controller directly and be able to pan things uh, uh, around. So the idea, it's one of the things that we're doing, try to bring sound particles, but almost like a 3D digital audio workstation. At the same time, we will continue creating plugins. We are uh, uh, the idea is to create artistic tools for people to explore special audio in a more interesting way. Um, until the end of the year, we're going to release one more plugin that is going to be uh, uh, huge from our point of view. People from music will re really, really uh, love it. Um, and also, besides that. We have Release Explorer that pretty much is a, a, a sound collection software um, that we wanted once again to bring full immersive support because there is already many uh, softwares out there to, to manage your sound collections. Uh, and they are very good, but they have a significant handicap is that they are mainly target for mono and stereo. And we wanted to create everything that where special audio is completely a first citizen on in that world and have all the features. For instance, if I have ambisonics recording and if I have if I have a, if I'm on my 5.1 studio, if I press play, I want the ambisonics to be automatically decoded and things like that. And in the future, we want to also bring some cloud features into it. And finally, the binaural and creating our own technology for binaural to see if we can improve. Uh, the technology in this area. So that's pretty much uh, all the, the the things that we have been involved. Of course, for us, what we have done so far, it's only the top of the iceberg. We have so many things that we want to do. For instance, sound particles alone, we have probably a list of literally 250 features that we want to bring into the, the, the software. Uh, and sometimes I, I tell uh, people that the, the worst part of my uh, work is that I have to uh, say no to wonderful ideas that people, our users or uh, our, our collaborators bring because, okay, we are a limited number of developers. We uh, uh, cannot do everything at the same time, but yeah. Essentially, it's been a, a quite a ride uh, be able to to work in this area, create this product, and have seeing those products being used by these amazing sound artists, and it's quite rewarding. Well, thanks for that, Nuno. It sounds like you've got a very busy year ahead of you. Yeah, <laughs> very busy indeed. Thank you for listening. And be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode, where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. Oh, and just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts website page, where you can explore what's playing on our other channels. 